after all this resumption of control by the Ukrainian authorities along the whole border. So from all this package, they only select the last item. So today when we touched upon this topic with Ms. Secretary, she said, yeah, we need to look at the sequence of steps. What do they mean? So they only pick out the items that are beneficial for the Kyiv regime on the resumption of control of the border. But this is only one item from the Minsk agreement. But there are others. And as for other items, Kyiv doesn't want to work on these two. And this is in the public statements of Kyiv. Same goes for the obligations on the indivisible security. So coordinate everything to smooth um, everyone's and uh, to smooth their concerns, and then the rest would be ignored as something artificially made up. This approach is not going to work. We don't want to threaten anyone. Have a look at the public statements. You've never heard any threats from us, but we are being threatened. By the way, in the House of Commons, the, sec uh, the Secretary said that, and she repeated this today, we heard the threats, and we heard the same during the talks. And same has been aired by the uh, British officials, uh, representatives of the British government. They, they say, if you do not stop the aggression, what aggression? When did it start? Against whom? They say, then you'll face the toughest consequences that you're going to regret. So these are the uh, kind of things. Have you ever heard anything like that from us? I'm pretty sure you'll never be able to cite any of such examples. So once again, I would like to highlight, we want the spirit of compromise, the spirit of looking for balance and taking into account mutual interest. This is supposed to help us to take, this helped us to sign documents within the OC, and I want this spirit of equality to help us with the agreements that have been set in stone and have been enshrined in documents. We want this to become realized and fulfilled. We don't want this to remain lip service. We stand ready for such cooperation. Ria Novosti, please. Good afternoon. I have a question to Foreign Office. Two questions, actually. Uh, can I ask some of our colleagues to switch off their mics? We hear noises. Yes, please continue. They appeared in the public documents called Undermining Russia. It's about financing Russian media and NGOs through British diplomatic missions, BBC and Reuters. Can you confirm that these documents really existed and this project existed? So this was the first question. And if you allow the second question, the UK stated that Russia builds up troops along the Ukrainian border, although this is in Russia, but the Russian, the British uh, warships um, in the Black Sea, um, they've been observed there. Do you not think that these actions of London are aggressive? There is no doubt that the stationing of over 100,000 troops on the Ukrainian border is directly put in place to threaten Ukraine. And this is not the only action that we've seen by the Russian authorities. We've seen cyber attacks and we've seen other attempts to undermine the activities of a sovereign nation, despite the fact that Russia signed up to the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, which agreed to protect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And can I remind you that in the UN uh, purposes and principles, it is very clear that all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force. And I can't see any other reason for having 100,000 troops stationed on the Ukrainian border apart from to threaten Ukraine. And if Russia is serious about diplomacy, they need to move those troops and desist from the threats. 
Now, if we are able to follow a path of diplomacy, and NATO has put offer on the table for talks to improve transparency, to improve confidence between the parties, then there are hopes of a better future. And what the British Embassy is doing here in Moscow is pursuing closer ties in areas like science, mathematics, and culture. But those closer ties will only result from a better relationship between the United Kingdom and Russia. And I also want to respond uh, to Minister Lavrov's point about indivisible security and the issues that were raised in the OSCE agreements. What it says is that there should be no undermining of another country's security. No one is undermining Russia's security. That is simply not true. And it is perfectly proper for sovereign nations such as Ukraine to defend themselves and to seek defensive alliances. That is part of protecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And on the subject of the Minsk agreements, Russia needs to fully implement the ceasefire. And it needs to remove the heavy weaponry from the region. That has to happen so that we can make progress on the Minsk agreements. Now, I think there is progress to be made. I think there is progress to be made between NATO and Russia on transparency, on discussions around security, and I think there is progress to be made on the Minsk agreements too. But Russia needs to properly engage, and they do need to de-escalate and move the troops away from the border. Uh, yes, please. Bring your novice to you. I'm sorry. You didn't respond to my question about the warships. And can you also corroborate the authenticity of the documents that were published by Anonymous? Thank you. In response to Russia's actions and the threatening behavior of Russia on the Ukrainian border, the United Kingdom is working with our NATO allies to make sure we are strengthening defense. This is purely defensive. NATO is a defensive alliance, and that is absolutely the right approach to take. But it would be better if Russia were to de-escalate and these responses weren't necessary. But we have to make sure that we are working with our NATO allies and we are standing by our security agreements. I've already responded on your points about the documents. Our embassy works in good faith with institutions across Russia to strengthen our relationship in areas from culture to mathematics to science. And that's what we want to do. But it is proving very difficult in an environment where Russia is actively threatening a sovereign nation. Diana, my news, if I can. Foreign Secretary, the uh, Foreign Sorry. Minister just Excuse characterized me. these talks as they don't introduce themselves? No. But uh, we have. Very sorry. To... Could we come to Tom Parfit of the Times, please? Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, a question first for Foreign Secretary Liz Truss, please. Um, President Macron of France said this week uh, that President Putin had committed to not launch any new military initiatives regarding Ukraine, and French officials indicated uh, that there were signs uh, that Russia was moving towards some kind of de-escalation. Um, have you received any kind of similar assurance? Um, do you see any evidence at all of some kind of Russian de-escalation, or have some of your European colleagues got the wrong end of the stick? And if I may as well, a question for Minister Lavrov. Minister Lavrov, were there 
any concessions or assurances uh, that you uh, received from Foreign Secretary Truss today um, regarding Russia's central concern over NATO enlightenment? Thank you. Minister Lavrov has said to me today that Russia have no plans to invade Ukraine. But we need to see those words followed up by actions, and we need to see the troops and the equipment that is stationed on the Ukrainian border moved elsewhere, because at present it is in a very threatening posture. And whilst I want to work towards a better outcome, it's vitally important that the UK and its NATO allies are prepared for all eventualities. That is why we are providing defensive support to Ukraine. It's why we're working to strengthen support across NATO. And it's why we have put in place a much tougher legislation on sanctions so we are ready in the event of an incursion. Now, my purpose here in Moscow today is absolutely to avoid that outcome and to work with Russia to make sure that we move ahead on talks with NATO. But that cannot come at the expense of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And it can't come at the expense of NATO's open door policy. I can confirm that this is precisely what Madam Secretary has been saying over the two hours that we spent behind closed doors. We have not had any other different tonality. The uh, demand that Russia should move the military that are stationed in the Russian territory, despite our arguments, well, this demand never came away. And this is at least regrettable. And when you say what President Macron has confirmed, that President Putin has assured him that there are no plans whatsoever to invade anyone, and when Madam Secretary comments on that and says that words should be backed by real actions. I have to say that this is a very interesting, very curious conversation. I have never participated in diplomatic talks that could, you know, be rendered absolutely public because there was nothing secret, nothing confidential, nothing based on trust. We have heard just what is proclaimed from the Tribune publicly in the UK. As far as words and actions are concerned, we always have believed that words and actions should be in tune, in sync. And that is why we draw attention to the interviews given by President Putin, the interviews given by the Foreign Ministry. They have been rendered public across the world, and all these materials demonstrate that you know, we were given vehement assurances that NATO would not move eastwards in the past, but then there were five waves of enlargement. Madam Secretary has just said that NATO is a defensive alliance, but still it has moved very close to Russian borders. You know, yes, NATO was a defense alliance when there was the Warsaw Treaty and when the Berlin Wall was still in existence, it was a line of defense, and everyone understands that. But right now, the wall is gone, the Warsaw Treaty is gone, and NATO decides on its own where the line is going to be, where NATO is going to serve its defense purposes. I can remind you that Jens Stoltenberg, on many occasions, has said that NATO has to have primary responsibility for security in the Indo-Pacific, in particular in the South China Sea. If NATO decides to use these areas as well for performing its functions, are you going, going to insist that each and every country has, to, has the right to choose wherever NATO is? I know we hear that all the time, even though we have many, uh, on many occasions provided information to NATO on how they bombed 
Yugoslavia and Iraq under the pretext that later was uh, called almost uh, a fake, uh, a, a mistake by Tony Blair. So the reproaches leveled at us by London as well as other Western capitals. The accusations that Russia is trying to interfere everywhere, that we are waging a cyber war, as we've heard today, you know, these speculations abound, even in well-respected media. There is information about Russia's alleged operation to uh, seize Kiev and the rest of Ukraine. There are allegations that Russia is preparing a coup d'etat to install a puppet regime in Kiev, you know. It's all, you know, from the narrative of highly likely. And I told Madam Secretary that this highly likely always stays highly likely, and nothing more than that. Let, let's talk about Russia, allegations against Russia with regard to Litvinenko case. No facts were produced. No facts were produced with regard to Skripal either. We do not know where they are. And uh, his daughter, who is a Russian citizen, we have no access to her. We have not seen any facts on Navalny, even though there was a whole campaign to denigrate Russia. And the UK is playing a bleeding role in this campaign. We have said today that we have to build our relations based on facts. Otherwise, it's going to be propaganda, pure and simple. But unfortunately, we have not heard any facts, nor has there been any reaction to the demand we have uh, put forth that the allegations against Russia have to be corroborated with facts. Uh, Madam Secretary has mentioned the Budapest Memorandum uh, regrettably, she says that for the second time today, even though we have provided very serious explanation on that matter during the talks, the Budapest Memorandum between the US, the UK and Russia provided security guarantees to Ukraine as a non-nuclear state. Standard guarantees provided to any, any non-nuclear state. The Budapest Memorandum did not force either the UK, the US, or Russia to recognize the anti-constitutional coup d'etat that was effected by neo-Nazis and ultra-radicals in uh, 2013. And this Budapest memorandum was accompanied by a declaration. And apart from the Troika, Russia, the UK, and the US, this uh, declaration was uh, signed by Russia, Ukraine, and France, and this declaration required that everyone, including Ukraine, should prevent any violations of the OEC principles, especially the uh, uh, respect for the rights of uh, national minorities, but uh, Ukraine didn't give a damn about that. No one is going to impose the necessity and in violation of all the Russia's obligations to recognize non-constitutional regimes and to um, somehow embellish the uh, actions that discriminate the Russian-speaking population and all the other actions that happen daily in the legislative activities of Ukraine with the active support of President Zelensky. And if we are talking about Ukraine, I also reminded Madam Secretary that Zelensky and his ministers, as well as his head of the Defense and Security Council, say in public that they are not going to comply with the Minsk agreements. Foreign Minister said directly that he does not want to have any direct dialogue with Donetsk and Luhansk because there is no such dialogue stipulated by the Minsk agreements. But this is Goebbels' Goebbels school, maybe even it supersedes the art of the main propaganda men of the Third Reich, because without beating an eyelash, they pronounce these lies and they ignore what has been written by the Security Council of the UN, and they do not care about what's going on in Berlin, Paris, or Washington, and this is not a very convenient position for a demagogues who stand for their righteousness and try to rewrite the Minsk agreements. Unfortunately, this also fell on deaf ears of our partners, although we discussed this in detail too. 
Yeah, was there any other question left that we did not cover? Or was it all? Uh, um, excuse me, this is um, Sky News. But now, next is Russia Today, and Sky News will be um, given the floor later. Thank you. Uh, Murad Gazdi. Murad Gaziev, Russia Today, if possible, I'm going to ask questions in English. Uh, two questions for you, if I may. You, you recently brought up uh, Chechnya in the context of what has happened in, in Ukraine. You said you remember well events back then. Uh, and the question is, Britain extended extraordinary support to Chechen separatists back then. We had we all remember uh, Margaret Thatcher who, hosting dinner for Aslan Mashadov, who was the then president of Chechnya. Uh, you, you had him and his subordinates following that then launch a series of horrendous uh, atrocities, acts of terror across Russia, hundreds dead, uh, the, the theater siege you may remember, after which the United States cut him off, saying he had lost all legitimacy. Uh, and the question is, why did Britain ex uh, extend such support for Chechen separatists uh, back then, despite the knowledge that there were thousands of Arab, uh, foreign, Ukrainian, Georgian fighters with, uh, with the Chechens? And why has Britain uh, shown none of that engagement with separatists and rebels in eastern Ukraine? And my second question is, if, if I may, uh, several years back, your boss, Boris Johnson, uh, said that uh, engaging with Russia diplomatically, and he mentioned Sergei Lavrov and President Putin by name, that engaging with them diplomatically was a fool's errand. Has uh, the Prime Minister changed his mind? And uh, are you here on what he would call uh, a fool's errand? The point I was making about both Chechnya and Afghanistan is the cost of war which is immense for all sides. Um, the point I'm making to the Russian government is that the Ukrainians will fight. And this would be a very protracted, prolonged conflict. We owe it to our populations. We owe it to European security to do all we can to avert a war in Ukraine. And that is why I'm here to work with the Russian government, to work with our NATO allies. Russia and the United Kingdom are both permanent members of the Security Council. I believe there is a better way, and that is what I am here to seek. And the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, is very much behind those efforts. If RT has no more questions, if you allow, I would still want to ask you, so did Boris Johnson change his opinion? ...about diplomatic engagement with, with Russia, and, and why haven't, hasn't Britain tried to engage the rebels and separatists in eastern Ukraine uh, directly? Why haven't they been invited for talks in, in London as Chechen separatists were? The Prime Minister is 100% behind us pursuing a diplomatic solution with our allies in NATO and others, and that's why I'm here in Moscow today, to make as much progress as we can and to work to take uh, those discussions forward. He is, you know, I've been very clear about that. And, you know, I'm not going to go into the where's and why for's of what's happened in the past. The situation we're in at the present is that the Minsk agreements have been agreed, but they haven't been implemented. And the first step has to be implementing the ceasefire and Russia removing its heavy weaponry from the region. That is the way we will make progress. Highly likely. Could we come to Diana Magne of Sky News, please? Thank you. Uh, 
Secretary, Foreign Minister Lavrov seemed to characterize your conversation just now as similar to being, if I understand it right, between a deaf and a mute. I wonder what your response to that would be. And also, you said that you were looking and hoping to encourage Russia along the path of a meaningful conversation on European security. Did you get any hint that Russia was prepared to engage on particular issues which might be meaningful? And a question for you, Foreign Minister Lavrov. This is clearly an exceptionally tense situation between nations, and de-escalation would help take the heat out of the situation. It is pretty normal to return troops to their bases after, for example, the exercises in Belarus. But are you prepared to make any meaningful gestures to de-escalate and take some of the heat out of this conversation? Uh, sorry, out, out, out of this situation. Well, first of all, uh, I wasn't mute in our discussions earlier. I put forward the UK's point of view on the current situation and the fact that, as well as seeking to deter Russia from an invasion into Ukraine, we are also very resolute in pursuing the diplomatic path. And I listened to what Foreign Minister Lavrov has to say. I think there are further talks to be had. NATO has put proposals on the table to improve transparency, to improve confidence, and I want us to take those talks forward.